Okay, so the Bible in seven passages, that's the name of the course that we're taking in this class. This is lesson number four in the series, and today we're going to do two of those passages, passages number three and number four, Genesis 11, 27 to 12, 7, and Isaiah 53, 1 to 12, and the title of the lesson today is The Person of Promise. Introduction and title is almost longer than the lesson itself, but anyways. So if you recall, our premise for this series of lessons uh, is a world in the future where the Bible is no longer available. Big tech, big government, big business, academia and the media have conspired to remove Bibles from the public access. And the result is biblical illiteracy in one generation. I mean, that's the premise. We, we talked about that in the first uh, lesson. And I suggested the idea that in such a scenario, it might be necessary to commit to memory seven key passage, uh, scripture passages that would provide a summary of what the Bible actually taught, not simply the things that they've been programmed to say about the Bible. So the series is entitled The Bible in Seven Passages where we are reviewing seven passages that attempt to summarize the entire 66 books of the Bible. Now the first of these was Genesis chapter one verse one that described the, the creation of the world. The second one was Genesis three one to 24 that explained the fall of man and God's promise to deal with this fall. In today's lesson, we're going to study passages number three and number four, where the Bible describes the person who would fulfill God's promise to man. Two passages of seven describe him. The first description is the historical person. The historical person. And that is Genesis 11, 27 through 12, verse seven. Now, until, up until the time of Abraham, there was no information revealed as to the promise that was originally made to Adam and Eve. People knew that God had promised them a savior of some kind, but there was silence as far as time or person or ministry were concerned. The first revelation about this matter comes to a man called Abram, who lived in the land of Ur, which is, of course, modern day Iraq. This passage introduces the family through which God will ultimately produce the individual who would fulfill the promise that was made originally in Genesis chapter three. The passage we're going to talk about grounds in history and in family what God had only promised in spirit. Genesis eleven twenty seven to 12, seven sets the opening scene of a storyline that will follow the human thread of the Savior's lineage from man, that's Abram, first called to produce the nation from which the Savior will ultimately come. And so the story begins by introducing a family that's in transition. Imagine, families in, trans families in transition, families that are moving, families that are changing, nothing new. We go back thousands of years in the opening scene is one of a family that's in transition. Genesis 11, 27 to 12, verse seven. So let's read a bit of that. It says, now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. 
The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So note the situation. Haran dies young. Nahor married his dead brother's daughter, in other words, his niece. Abram married his half-sister Sarai, who is said to be barren. We have few details, but it seems that Terah, along with his son Abram, Abram's wife Sarai, and his grandson Lot, left Ur in order to make his way to Canaan. They only got as far as the city of Haran, probably built and established in memory of his dead son, Haran, and they remained there. Now the story of Terah ends here. He may have refused to go on. He may have been sick, we don't know. All we do know is that his original journey was to go to Canaan, but he never made it there. This sets the scene for the call and the life of Abram, and that continues in chapter 12. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So now the Lord calls Abram to leave Haran and <clears throat> the things that were keeping him in Haran. His country, I mean the people of that era rarely left their villages, let alone their countries. You, know, you were born in a village you died in the village. It's very rare things to leave, your, to leave your village, let alone your country. He left his culture, his language, his traditions, his family, his friends, his work, his home, his land. He left all of that behind. Abraham is asked to leave everything. However, God makes a series of promises to him if he does, if he does leave. First of all, he'll give rise to a great nation and that he himself will become a great man. He will bless others with his life and God will protect him. And the entire world throughout history will be blessed through Abram. Now these sound like great blessings, but consider Abram's state. I mean, he, he, he had to completely forsake home, family, nation, and culture in order to have a great nation built from himself. He had to abandon the safety of what was familiar in order to go into unknown, or to go into the unknown, with only the promise of God's protection, but no visible sign of it. It's not like he said, poof, here's a thousand soldiers and they'll go with you everywhere and nobody will harm you. He, only, he had God's word, that's it. Now, the journey to Canaan was approximately 400 miles with his family and servants, along with livestock and possessions. In verse seven, the Lord appears to Abram. The first time this is expressed in this particular way, that the Lord appeared, and it was to add one more thing to the list of promises. And that is that the people he was living, uh, that the land he was living in would one day be the possession of his people. Now, with time, God changed Abram's name, which meant high or exalted father. He changed it to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. And so this passage, as one of our seven passages, identifies the source and the stream of the nation that served as a cultural and religious and political and historical stage 
upon which the promise or the seed of woman would make his appearance. It answers the question, where would this promised one come from? Or what nation would produce the seed that was to defeat the evil one? Were people to look for him among the leading nations of history, the Egyptians perhaps, or the Greeks? In Genesis 11, 27 to chapter 12, verse seven, that passage answers that question by showing that God selected and called one man I mean, he himself, Abram, he was a Chaldean from the Mesopotamian region of Ur with its own multiple deities and temples and priests and traditions. One guy he called from there and revealed himself to this one man and set about to make of him a believer in the one true and living God to make of him an example of the kind of faith God wanted all believers to have and to make of him the human starting point for a people whose culture and religion and laws and historical experience would be a living witness of not only the promise that would be delivered through their nation, a savior, but also the reason why the promise was made in the first place. And that is of course man's guilt and condemnation due to sin. And the way that this condemnation would be removed, and that is of course through vicarious atonement. And this man and the nation that came from this man would demonstrate how God would you know, uh, remove the sin of mankind, and that is you know, through vicarious atonement. And how did he demonstrate this? Well, through the priestly sacrificial system at the temple. That was to be a preview of what was to come. But in order to have priests and a temple and all of that, you had to have a people. And those people had to have a religion and those people had to be taught that religion. And all of this began with one person, Abram. He was the one from which all of this would eventually develop. And so the entire Old Testament after this passage simply lays out the fulfillment of God's promises to Abram by describing the growth and the development of Abraham's family from a single family unit to 12 tribes, and then finally to a great nation in possession of their own land. Starting from Abraham, the Bible traces each generation throughout the centuries, along with its wars and kings and interactions with God and ongoing prophecies concerning the fulfillment of the original promise. Now, this uh, third passage ties together the physical history from the promise made in the garden to the main vehicle that would sustain that promise throughout history, and that would be the Jewish people, starting with Abram, linked to the appearance of Jesus, who would be the son of Joseph of Nazareth, who was of the tribe of Judah, in other words, who was a descendant of Abraham. So there's the historical link right there. You get the promise in the garden and then the promise is uh, uh, going to be fulfilled through a group of people and that group of people will be formed through Abraham. So there, there's the tent pole, if you wish, or, 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 or you know, the post at the beginning in Genesis and then the promise is going to be fulfilled by this man and his people and, and, and you can draw a straight line from this man and his people all the way to Jesus. That's the historical link right there. You've got the historical link of the promise. Now note that I did not include the other important identity marker for Jesus or the Savior, which is he was to be the son of God. Because this link to David and Judah all the way back to Abraham does not identify him as the one fulfilling the promise. For this, we have to look to the prophets. In other words, when we look at Abraham, we see the historical link between the garden and the fulfillment of the promise. But we have to look to the prophets to see the spiritual link between the garden and the fulfillment of the promise, okay? So that spiritual link is developed 
through the prophets, and one prophet in particular, Isaiah, and one passage in particular, Isaiah 53, <clears throat> verses one to 12. Isaiah describes to us the person of promise from a spiritual perspective. From Abraham, we see him from a historical perspective. Where he comes from? Well, he comes from the Jewish people. Well, where do they come from? Well, they come from Abram, okay? Isaiah is going to explain to us where does he come from spiritually? Who is he spiritually? Now, according to uh, scholars, uh, there are anywhere between 200, because they, some of them debate over it, 200 to 400 prophecies concerning Christ contained in the Old Testament and fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament, according uh, to the Association for Bible Research. The fulfillment of prophecy is one of the major arguments for the inspiration of the Bible. In other words, only an inspired book could have fulfilled prophecy. You know, something special about the Bible because it's got fulfilled prophecy in it. All right? So the Bible, as I've mentioned before, is the only holy book that contains both prophecy and conf uh, confirmed fulfillment in the same text. You can read in one part of the Bible a prophecy being made and then you can go forward in the Bible hundreds of years later where it's being described that that prophecy is being fulfilled. It's the only holy type book that has this feature. As I said before, the Old Testament from Abraham primarily tells the story of the Jewish nation. But interlaced with this story is the golden thread of prophecy from generation to generation that spoke of God's promise and seed to come at a certain point of both human and Jewish history. The Jews were God's chosen people, you know, starting with Abram, but they were chosen for a reason, and that reason was to bring Christ into the world. The prophets, however, were the ones who put a face and a purpose to the person of the promise. Oh, I wish Dayton was here, he would have loved that one. There were four Ps in a row there. Now the fourth of seven passages, therefore, is from one of those prophets, the prophet Isaiah. More than any other prophet, Isaiah's prophecies concerning the Messiah describe the character of the person as well as his actual mission in saving man from eternal condemnation. And so, in Isaiah chapter 53, verses one to three, we read, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one for whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. So Isaiah begins by anticipating doubt and disbelief of the things that he is about to say concerning the Messiah. And that is that the Messiah would suffer. He goes on to describe a man who would have no natural appeal to others and who would be considered of low esteem and rejected by most people. In other words, he would not be the Hollywood Jesus. The Hollywood Jesus is a tall, handsome man. You know, he's a nice strapping six footer in, in, in most Jesus movies. Uh, when the average height of uh, Jewish men <laughs> at that time was about five foot three. That was the average height of men at, the, at that time, five foot three, five foot four, you know. Uh, and, and Isaiah goes out of his way to say he was not, quote, as we say today, charismatic, attracting people to himself. You know, he walks into a room and everybody just touches because it's him, you know. He didn't have that aura, he didn't have that charisma. He says there was nothing about him, you know, physically, that drew you to him. We continue reading. 
He says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression, transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So Isaiah describes the various aspects of Jesus' sufferings. The manner that he would suffer, and that would be, he did so quietly. What did he write? He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Isaiah describes the reason for his suffering. Well, the reason for his suffering, he paid the moral debt for our sins with his suffering and death on the cross. What does Isaiah say? But he was pierced through for our transgressions. That's vicarious atonement. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. That's vicarious atonement. Someone else paying the price for what we did wrong. Isaiah describes the meaning of Jesus' death 700 years before it actually took place. Isaiah describes the result of Jesus' suffering. And that is um, his intercession removes the sins of those who believe in him, which was the promise made in the garden at the beginning. And Isaiah describes the proof that his suffering was effective in removing sins and guilt, and that is the resurrection. Nowhere else in scripture do we find a more comprehensive description of the person and the mission of the Messiah, exactly fulfilled some eight centuries later by Jesus Christ. This key passage also serves as the link that connects the Old Testament and the New Testament in our, you know, the Bible in seven passages. This passage here brings together both Old and New Testament. Uh, and it does so because it summarizes the information concerning the Messiah and his mission that is symbolized and described in the story of the Jewish nation, including their religious system and teachings, and it concentrates all of these in a single person. So Isaiah takes everything that the Jews were doing, you know, their sacri sacrificial system, the offering of sacrifice, all that stuff. He takes all of that and just in a few verses demonstrates on how all of that was simply a preview of what was ultimately to come. Not animals being offered and sacrificed, a human being, a Messiah, 
that would be offered in sacrifice. It also points directly to a specific person, the Messiah, a specific mission, vicarious atonement, a specific result, forgiveness of sin leading to justification of the sinner, and a specific sign of vindication, which is the resurrection. All of these things are wrapped into a single person and a single event to appear and take place in the future of the Jewish nation. This is why when they talk about Isaiah, Isaiah 53 being probably the most powerful messianic uh, prophecy in the Old Testament, you see why. You see why. And this prophecy is so specific that it could only be fulfilled by a Jewish man living on earth as part of the Jewish people. He describes a person, a man, not a nation, not a group, not an idea, not a philosophy. He talks about a living person, a living male person. Exactly what he will do, exactly what will happen to him, exactly the type of person he would be, exactly what he would accomplish and how he would accomplish it. I mean, it's just amazing. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself uses a passage from Isaiah to openly declare that he was indeed the Messiah produced by the Jewish nation and spoken of by the Jewish prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, thus fulfilling all that was written in what we call the Old Testament and establishing as well as confirming the authority of the writings that we refer to as the New Testament. In Luke chapter four, we read, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread throughout, uh, through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes, uh, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And I, 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 just, I get chills just thinking about that moment when those people were sitting in the synagogue because they knew what we know. You know. They knew Isaiah was describing somebody that was going to come one day. Imagine, he said, today, Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah, those prophecies are being fulfilled today. You've just heard, now is the time. Exciting. So in an effort to summarize and maintain the key information and message of the Bible in only seven passages, the ones we have looked at in today's study have provided the following. Genesis eleven twenty seven to 12, verse seven. This passage describes the way that God will fulfill his promise to save sinful man. And that will be through the agency of a person born of a nation specifically chosen and formed by God for this reason. That's what Genesis 11 and 12 there, that's what it establishes. The Savior will be a descendant of Abraham and the Old Testament will describe how this nation will eventually produce this one person. So that passage describes that. And then Isaiah 53 verses one to 12, which would be in our series, passage number four. 
This passage in Isaiah describes the Messiah, his mission, the results of his mission, and the way to verify his credibility. Isaiah's prophecy brings together the ultimate purpose of the creation of the Jewish nation, and that was to produce the Messiah, with the ultimate purpose of the Messiah, and that is to save mankind from spiritual death. And these two projected to a definite future time and place. In other words, the passage in Genesis looks forward. We're, we're going to build a nation and it'll be a great nation you know, that looks forward. And then the passage in Isaiah, and out of that nation, someone will come and that someone will do this and that and the other and will fulfill the promise. These two passages. All right, so with the study of these two passages complete, we're going to move on to our last three passages, which are all found in the New Testament. Three last passages found in the New Testament. All right, so that's our lesson for today. Thank you for your attention.